Hello, my name is Alyssa Peterson. I am one of the student success coordinators um, on the second floor. Um, in this video, we're going to be talking about um, kind of just an overview of chapter 30, which is all the newborn and infant assessments um, and things that you'll see um, common like normal findings and abnormal findings and what that means um, and what you need to do for it. Um, and at the very end, we'll kind of go over some test questions uh, and break those down. Um, so with the newborn and infants and same thing with um, the young children and adolescents, um, it's not necessarily tested over in just one test. It kind of can show up in every test. And so this is a great little overview that you can use um, kind of almost before each test because it goes through, um, you might see questions about newborns depending on what system that you're being tested on. So it's not necessarily the whole chapter at once, um, but it'll be just little bits and pieces. But I'm just kind of doing this one video all at once that you can review um, before you need to. So starting out with um, just a normal growth and development of newborns and infants, and that's a lot of what PD is. It's just normal assessments. Um, what do you expect to find um, in normal developmental stages um, is a big one for PD. Um, but in assessment, we're going to focus on um, kind of just like their normal um, what you should expect when you're when you're doing a head to toe assessment. So, whenever you see the word newborn or neonate, um, that is referring to a kiddo that is between one minute old um, to 28 days old. Um, it's basically their first month, right? That's when you're a newborn. You turn into an infant um, after that 28th day and up into your first year. Um, so that's the population that we're looking at. So make sure that you know um, what kind of uh, baby that you're assessing. Is it a newborn or is it an infant? Because that's going to change um, depending on how old they are. And it also might change um, what is an expected finding depending on how old they are. So um, looking at their skin, hair, and nails, um, the acrocyanosis that you see in newborns, so kind of the purplish or bluish tint that they have on their hands and feet, that's completely normal for newborns. Um, you know, the blood after they are delivered, they take that big deep breath and all that oxygen and blood is being rushed to their brain and heart and lungs, um, you know, more important organs um, than kind of the hands and feet and toes get the shaft, they kind of get the, the short end of the stick. Um, after a couple days, their hands tend to pink up and they're fine, but I can't tell you how many times new parents have asked me, you know, is something wrong with my baby? His hands and his feet are, are purple. Um, you know, in the hospital, I'm a labor and delivery nurse and you just have to reassure them that that's totally normal and they're, they'll pink up in the next couple days. Now, if their gums are blue or purple, that's a different story. But um, acrocyanosis, uh, totally normal for newborns. Um, their skin may appear mottled on their trunk or their arms or legs, kind of has that um, like spidery looking um, texture to it. And that's really normal for newborns, especially when, if they're cold. Um, lanugo, that's that fine downy hairs that you'll see on the baby's skin. Um, and that actually helps protect the baby when they're in utero. Um, so from all the fluid that they're kind of swimming around in, right? If you think about it, they're taking like a um, hot bath for nine months. And so they have lots of skin um, and other things that are on their um, skin called um, vernix and it's kind of this white cream cheesy type substance that um, is on their skin and so actually the younger that the baby is developed so or the younger that the baby is born so say you delivered um, your baby at 35 weeks they'll have more hair and more of that vernix um, versus a baby that was born at 40 weeks, completely term, um, some of that hair 
tends to kind of slough off. Um, and then once they're out, the hair will disappear within about that first two weeks of life. Um, a hair tuft that's on their their back or their sacral area, um, that is an abnormality um, and that could actually um, should be a red flag for some sort of like spine or spinal cord um, development that didn't go quite right. And so, you know, that fine downy hair that's all over the body, that's dispersed evenly throughout the body, that's okay. But if there's just a big patch of hair kind of right above their bottom in their lower back, that could be an indication of um, some sort of um, spinal cord development that didn't go right in utero. Um, so that's something that if you're examining during your assessment that, that you need to um, kind of go up the chain and, and notify someone that you've come across that. Um, so moving on to head and neck, um, babies' heads are really soft and malleable. Um, so their cranial bones are separated um, between coronal, lambdoid, and sagittal sutures. It's just all like that um, loose um, joints between all the um, sutures in your in your head and all the different um, parietal and occipital and frontal and um, and temporal lobe. Um, it's where they all kind of meet. And so when you're newborns, they haven't really fused together. They're, they're still able to move around a little bit so the baby can pass through um, the birth canal. So when you have some of that where um, it's called molding, um, it's kind of where the um, lobes or those suture lines kind of overlap a little bit, um, and that's so that the baby can pass through the birth, birth canal. And sometimes it can be a little asymmetrical depending on the presentation of the baby's head or face as they were coming out and down through mom's pelvis, but it could also be just the shape of mom's pelvis. Um, maybe she needed to go to the chiropractor before she went into labor, and so her hips were kind of a little wonky, and so baby's head came out just a little crooked and so you can have that asymmetrical molding and that typically goes away within a couple days as well. So an eye assessment on a newborn or an infant, um, their iris, iris shows little pigment at birth and um, they don't have a lot of coloration. Um, the pupils are small, the pupillary reflex um, is poor, but by the time they hit about five months old, um, it's improved. They're all far-sighted at birth, um, and they can't fixate on an object until they're about four months old. So um, really poor vision. The best um, distance that newborns can see you at is about six to eight inches from their face. And so um, that is kind of the normals that you need to know for eyes. Um, for newborns and infants. Ears, um, they are startled by high frequency sounds um, and then calmed by low frequency sounds, right? So um, they'll have that startle reflex if they hear anything that's high pitched, like a whistle, their sibling screaming in the other room, um, low frequency sounds, you know, that's why babies kind of fall asleep to lullabies. Um, they're calmed by them. So external auditory canal um, curves upward, and so whenever you're doing an ear assessment um, on a baby, the pinna should be pulled down and back for the otoscope exam. So that's the difference um, between an adult and a newborn or infant. Adults, you're going to pull it um, up and back. Um, babies you're going to pull down and back and that's because of the shape of their um, their canal, their ear canal. Um, and that's why they're also at risk for increased infection because they have short and wide um, eustachian tubes. Um, and so that's a really common test question that you'll probably see. Um, why is it that children are at increased risk for ear infection? Um, and it's not necessarily that kids put more things in their ears, which um, 
they do, um, but not necessarily newborns and infants, right? They're not exploring and um, testing those kind of boundaries quite yet. Um, it's because of the shape and size of their, their ears. Um, if baby has an auto, uh, autonomic anomaly of the ears, um, so if their ears aren't shaped right, this, they're misformed, um, the kidneys and ears in utero are developed at the same time. And so um, if you're doing a newborn assessment and you notice there's some sort of um, abnormality with the shape of their ears, uh, then you want to tell that to the provider so that that should raise a red flag of we also need to check out this kiddo's kidneys as well and see what's going on, see if there was any other sort of development um, interruptions that happened while they were in utero. So um, moving on to their mouth, throat, nose, and ears, and sinuses. Um, baby teeth or the deciduous teeth, they typically t start to erupt anywhere between um, 6 to 24 months old. So um, it's a kind of a big range. Um, you know, I know one-year-olds or two and, you know, almost two-year-olds that are just starting to get their first teeth. And so while well, other babies, you know, had a mouthful of teeth at age one and started, you know, showing their teeth at like five or six months old. So it's a big range. Um, the big takeaway about their um, mouth and throat and nose is that newborns and infants are obligatory uh, nose breathers. That means they have to breathe out of their nose. They will not open their mouth and breathe out of their mouth. And so um, if you see any sort of signs of distress, like they're grunting, they're having nasal flaring, and they're using those accessory muscles and retracting in order to, to breathe um, and maintain their oxygen saturation levels, um, you want to inspect their nose and make sure that there's nothing blocking their nasal passage. It might just mean that they need to be bulb suctioned because they're a little snotty or they have um, extra mucus up in their nasal passageway. As soon as you get that out, they can breathe easily again, right? That's a quick, easy fix that I can do, an easy assessment that I can do that would hopefully um, solve, solve the problem quickly. Now, there could be something else going on, but if I know that that nasal passage is obstructed and I know that they have to breathe through their nose, um, that's something that I can assess really quick and fix potentially really quick as well. Um, the thorax and lungs. Um, so fetal lungs are one of the last systems to develop, and so that's why we really encourage um, moms not to do any sort of like elective inductions or um, and uh, induce their labor before their term um, just for convenience or tired of being pregnant because the lung maturity is one of the last systems that um, the fetus is going to develop. So um, you'll kind of go into more detail about like the anatomy and physiology of the lungs when you get into OB. Um, but just kind of a quick overview. Um, once the baby's delivered and they have that first cry, blood flow to the lungs becomes more vigorous and, and that causes your lungs to expand um, greater and it relaxes the pulmonary arteries. Um, decrease in pulmonary pressure closes the foramen ovale and increases lung, uh, increases oxygen tension um, and closes the ductus arterius. So again, probably not something that you'll really be tested over um, in assessment, um, but it's a good reference um, to, for, you know, when you get a little bit further down the road into OB. Um, Breasts with newborns, um, their breast buds are typically enlarged because mom has such high estrogen levels um, at the end of her pregnancy um, that it affects uh, newborns as well. So they might have a little bit of like swelling or, or um, small little breast buds when you do your assessment and that's normal. Um, they'll kind of, kind of go back down in just a bit, a bit of time. 
um, cardiac system for newborns and babies and infants. Um, so the placenta is where oxygenation takes place for the fetal circulation. So that's that um, organ that is developed um, kind of right at the beginning of pregnancy. Um, the outer tissue that is developed um, develops into a placenta. The inner tissue develops into the fetus, into the baby. Um, the lungs are bypassed while they're in utero. Um, and the arterial blood is returned on the right side of the heart. So everything's a little bit different when they're um, in utero. Um, the blood is shunted from the foramen ovale and the ductus arteriosus into the left side and then out the aorta. So here's a really two great videos that kind of help um, draw out um, your fetal circulation and your newborn circulation. The big things that you need to remember um, for this class is normal heart rates, right? And so newborn heart rates, they're gonna be anywhere between 120 and 160. Um, at six months of age, um, they'll be pretty consistently in the 120s. At six months to a year, they're in the 110s. Um, so the heart rates are pretty fast. Sometimes it can be hard to count, um, but just know that that's normal for for newborns. Oh, okay. Their peripheral peripheral vascular system, like I said, the acrocyanosis is normal, especially if they're cold. But really, for those first couple days, um, it's very normal for them to kind of have bluer hands and feet. Um, you're gonna be assessing the radial, brachial, and femoral pulses in your newborn assessment, um, and they should all be equal bilaterally. You should be able to feel all of those. The um, abdomen, um, so your umbilical cord has two arteries and one vein, um, and then typically it dries up and falls off with about two weeks. Um, the biggest thing that you need to do as far as teaching um, is just to leave it alone. <laughs> um, don't put any alcohol on it. Um, make sure that it's um, dry, um, clean, away from any sort of irritation or rubbing. Sometimes the diaper can kind of rub up on it. A lot of diapers have those little cutouts to where it doesn't, but um, you can teach the parents to kind of fold that diaper down for the first couple weeks well, until the umbilical cord is completely gone or, or off. And then obviously teaching about signs and symptoms of infection. Um, the genitalia for newborns, um, testes um, should be palpated at birth. Um, for term infants, you should be able to feel each testy. Um, again, female genitalia is gonna be engorged due to maternal hormones, and it's gonna go back down to normal in a few weeks. Same things with um, the testicles. The um, it, they'll be enlarged as well. Um, so the anus, rectum, and prostate of newborns. Um, meconium, that is the first stool that passes um, for babies. Um, sometimes it does pass while they're still in utero and then that fluid becomes um, kind of green tinged. Uh, meconium is really thick, um, almost black and tarry. Um, and so we want it to pass once they're delivered within that first 24 hours. Um, and that is a sign of anal patency, right? It means that all the pipes and pumps are working. Um, if something made it out and they've had a dirty diaper, then we know that um, they have a patent anus. Um, if it has not passed within 24 hours, then it could be a sign that maybe the baby's not getting enough um, breast milk or formula, they're dehydrated, but typically that is more associated with um, wet diapers, not necessarily that first meconium. The first meconium should come out within the first 24 hours. Now, if we don't have anal patency and that meconium is just kind of stuck there, um, they will, the newborns will actually have to go into surgery to, in order for them to perforate and uh, make 
basically an anal opening. So it's something that's really serious. Um, it can actually kill newborns. So it's something that you need to assess closely um, and follow up with the moms while they're in the hospital if they're keeping a log of like wet and poopy diapers and then also how often they're feeding. Um, that should be done while they're in the hospital and taught to do once they get home as well. So <clears throat> when we're checking for hip dysplasia in newborns, um, there's two different tests that we're gonna do. Um, the Ortolani and the Barlow's sign. And this is when you're gonna bring the baby's legs kind of together and up towards their abdomen. And you're gonna keep your hands on the sides of their hips. Um, and then once they're up and together, you're gonna rotate them out and down to the side. And if you feel any sort of clicking or popping, or if you actually feel their hip um, dislocate, that is a positive sign. If you feel the head um, of the femur slip out of the hip socket. Um, so those are things that we don't want to happen. Um, we want them to be negative signs. There's no clicking or um, popping or s slipping um, felt. Um, but those are the two tests that we check for um, congenital hip dysplasia. Um, they have full range of motion at birth. Um, their um, cervical spine is in a C shape, um, so they're kind of curved in their back, um, and that's normal for newborns. Um, as far as neuro, uh, most newborns' actions are primitive, and they have all primitive reflexes, so that's like your grasp reflex, your rooting reflex, your sucking reflex. Um, motor, neuron, uh, motor control develops in the head and neck um, to trunk to the extremities in that, in that order. Um, they are... Um, for their Erickson stages, they're in trust versus mistrust. And then for Freud, they're in the oral stage. They put everything in their mouths, right? Um, so just know that those are the different stages for um, newborns and infants. Nutrition, um, the only food requirement for babies up to six months is breast milk. Um, no sort of table foods, um, baby foods, that doesn't get introduced until after six months of age. Um, the formula that you need to know for um, how many calories they get for, per day, it's 100 calories per kilogram per day, um, so then you can do any sort of calculations um, with that formula. That'll become more important once you get to OB. Um, feedings should be offered every three to four hours, um, and really you're counting as long as they get eight feedings within a 24-hour period, then they should maintain um, the amount of calories that are needed and, and um, stay hydrated. Um, no solid food should be introduced until they can lift up their own head. They're at a higher risk for choking or aspiration if they um, are introduced too early. Um, if they're mouthing um, their hands or um, any toys and they're interested in, in their parents' food while you're eating dinner, um, they're wanting to grab stuff off your plate. But really, they have to be able to hold up their own head and before they can um, introduce any sort of baby food. Um, when you're introducing foods, you're going to do it one at a time. Um, so do sweet potatoes first. Only do sweet potatoes for three or four days. And then w once you realize they've had no sort of um, allergic reaction to that or adverse reaction to that, then you can do peas for three to four days. Same thing, just do peas and then move on to your next food. Um, and that's just to eliminate any sort of allergies that they might, they might have. Um, at eight to 10 months, that's when you can introduce finely chopped finger foods. Um, hopefully you have some teeth at that point, um, but they're at too much of a risk before that um, age. Um, if babies that are exclusively breastfed, um, it's recommended that you add some sort of daily vitamin D supplement into um, their diet um, so you can um, that might be a test question that you might see what what sort of supplements might a um, exclusively breastfed baby need. 
um, no honey for the first year of life, um, they that could uh, transfer botulism. So we don't introduce any sort of honey um, until after they've had their first birthday. Okay, so moving on with the assessment procedure onto respiratory. Um, so normal respiratory rates for newborns and infants are going to be 30 to 60 breaths per minute. So again, that can be kind of hard to count, um, but anything greater than that, that's going to be considered tachypneic. That's when you're going to look for those signs of distress. So grunting, they kind of um, have, a, have a little uh, grunt with each exhale. Nasal flaring is a sign of distress. Striders, rails, um, anything like that um, should kind of uh, raise a red flag that something else is going on. Um, let's see, um, apical pulse, again 120 to 160. Um, if they're crying, it can go up to 180, um, but typically that's your normal range. That lanugo we talked about, the hair on thin hair that's on their backs and their shoulders. Um, yellow skin tone and um, that indicates that they might have some jaundice going on so they're having a hard time um, getting rid of that bilirubin in their blood um, the more feedings that they can do and then sometimes if it's more intense they have to do phototherapy but um, jaundice is a really common problem in newborns and that's something that we watch out for carefully when um, they're in the hospital so here is some pictures of newborn skin. Um, again, jaundice in that top left corner, um, kind of that yellowish tint. They kind of have yellow in their um, sclera in their eyes as well. Um, again, feeding, sometimes putting them under phototherapy is required if, if the levels get too high. Um, Amelia, it's kind of those little white head, little bumps, um, kind of like newborn acne. Um, that can be really common in newborns. Hemangioma, um, that is a increase in blood vessels, like a um, concentration in blood vessels, either in their hands or in their face. Um, my son actually had that when he was born. It didn't show up right away. It kind of started to develop around day three or four after birth. And so um, most, of the, most of the time they go away. I think they told me by age five, 85% um, of them are, are gone or really hard to detect and then by age 10 it's like 90% of them are gone. So and they tend to go away um, as they get older. But port wine stains do not. Those will be with them for the rest of their life. And so again those are really common either on the face or on the hands. Um, Mongolian spots, you'll see those with um, babies that are maybe have darker complexion. Um, and typically they're right on like the sacral area or lower back. Kind of looks like they're bruised almost. It's kind of like a bluish um, tint or um, um, splotches around their, their back or their kind of go, goes all over. Their back can go up to their shoulders too. Um, but that's a normal finding. No, there's no problems with that. Um, and then those stork bites, um, again, just a small little rash that you can notice kind of on the nape of their neck, on the back of the neck, um, and that's completely normal as well. So looking at some pictures of the head and neck, um, baby should be normocephalic and symmetric. Um, newborns that have like that cone head shape, that's from the molding that's passing through the vaginal canal. Um, again, that kind of goes away after a couple days. Find my pointer. Um, so you can see right here that molding where everything is kind of pushed back. Um, and that's from the baby moving through the vaginal canal um, during pushing and during labor. Um, bulging fontanelles, um, that's when you're going to... Um, probably see that with increased cranial pressure. And so you can see that kind of where the sagittal sutures meet. Um, you have your posterior fontanelle and then your anterior fontanelle. 
Um, and so if they're bulging or you can kind of see them pulsating, that means there's increased cranial pressure. If they're sunken, um, that is a sign of dehydration for newborns. Um, and then um, this is the difference between between just like normal molding or caput um, and then a cephalohematoma. This is where you're just going to have um, that bruising or pooling of blood um, unilaterally. It doesn't cross the sagittal suture line like caput um, or molding does. Um, so this is more indicative of like maybe they had there was more trauma during delivery. So maybe they had to use like a vacuum to deliver and then it caused um, that pooling of blood underneath um, the scalp. Um, or maybe it just happened during delivery um, just in mom's pelvis. But um, if it crosses the sagittal suture line, that is cap it. If it's unilateral and it kind of stops right in the middle, that's, that's gonna be considered a cephalohematoma. So again, here's, um, again, uh, checking for the congenital hip dysplasia, um, Barlow sign, um, negative is a normal sign. You're gonna move their legs up and towards their stomach. Um, if you feel the femur slip out of the socket, you need further evaluation. Um, or tenoli maneuver, um, negative is normal. If you hear any clicking or popping as the femur, um, as you move the legs outwards, then that's a positive sign. It's a possible that the baby has some sort of congenital hip dysplasia. <clears throat> so these are the reflexes um, and typically when they're gonna disappear by. So you're rooting, <clears throat> if you kind of brush the cheek of the baby, then the baby's gonna churn towards that side um, wherever he's feeling the stimulation on that side of that cheek, um, looking for a breast to, to latch onto. <clears throat> sucking, that's um, just your normal sucking reflex. You can test it um, by placing a gloved finger in the baby's mouth um, and kind of making sure that your nail is against his tongue and not up at the soft um, roof or the soft palate of his mouth. Um, but once your finger's in his mouth, he should automatically start to suck. Um, the palmer grasp, that's when anything that comes um, in contact right by their hand, they're gonna close their fingers around it and grab on. The planter grasp, same thing, but with the feet, if you put your finger right kind of at the base of their toes, they'll curl their toes around, um, and that typically disappears around um, 10, or sorry, eight to 10 months. The Moro reflex, um, that's the startle reflex. Um, <clears throat> typically how we test that in the hospital is you kind of lift their arms up just a little bit, but not to where they're off of their crib or their mattress, um, but then release the arms and they kind of um, jump their arms out and try to grab onto something and they'll cry because they feel like they're falling. Um, the Babinski's reflex, that's when you um, stroke the side of their foot or the bottom of their foot and their toes fan out, and that should disappear within two years. And then the stepping reflex, if you hold a newborn up and kind of um, make sure you're supporting their shoulders and their neck, um, but put their feet on a flat surface, they'll actually kind of put one foot in front of the other um, like they're like they're big kids and trying to walk and they're just, you know, two weeks old, they'll still do it. So again, um, swollen genitalia in newborns is really common. That's due to high maternal hormone levels. Um, but the big thing that you'll probably be tested on um, are the different type of um, urethral placements that, that are possible with um, male babies. So um, phimosis, that's when your foreskin, the baby's foreskin skin cannot retract over the penis. Like you can't pull the foreskin back. Um, and so there's really not a patent opening um, <clears throat> for the, the urethra. Um, that would need surgery. Um, paraphimosis, that is when the 
foreskin that is that's when the foreskin is left retract in the retracted position it can't relax back and so uh, you kind of get like a buildup of blood and then that causes some edema around the foreskin as well so um, that really needs to be looked at closely um, and followed up um, if you notice that um, you're starting to have some swelling around um, the head of the penis and around that foreskin um, hypospadus, that is when the urethra is, um, the opening is actually underneath the gland. So um, the urine is coming out not at the tip of the gland, but um, kind of under. Um, and then um, people can have, babies can have surgery to correct that as well. And then the epispadus, that is where the urethra is on top or on the dorsal side of the gland. Um, so all things that you need to watch and assess for closely when you're assessing your newborn in the hospital setting. So now we are going to move over to some practice questions and test questions. Okay, so let's read this question and then we'll kind of break it down. Um, which action by the nurse demonstrates the correct technique to elicit the orth orthogonal maneuver? Um, you're going to spread the buttocks with gloved hands, abduct the legs and move the knees inward, adduct the legs until the nurse's thumbs touch, or assess the symmetry of the gluteal folds. So um, this is where we're checking for hip dysplasia. Um, so we can kind of eliminate A and D. We're going to spread the buttocks with gloved hands or assess the symmetry of the gluteal folds. We, D, we kind of do when we're assessing for hip dysplasia. Sometimes you can tell um, <clears throat> like if one side is less than the other or they, they don't look symmetrical, then um, it's a possibility, but that's not actually what this maneuver is. Um, so we're kind of down between B and C, so we're going to um, abduct the legs and move the knees inward or adduct the legs until the nurse's thumbs touch. So this is when we're actually going to adduct the legs and move the knees inward, move the knees together. And we're feeling for any sort of um, clicking or popping. Your fingers are going to kind of stabilize the trochanter on, the, on each side. Um, and feel for any sort of popping, um, making sure that those hips um, are staying in alignment and you're not feeling anything abnormal. Okay, which assessment parameter should the nurse perform to determine physical maturity in the baby? Inspect for lanugo, assess the posture, auscultate the apical pulse, or flex the elbow. So, <clears throat> We're wanting to determine how old this baby is, like at which gestational age um, was this baby actually born. Um, so inspecting the lanugo, um, assessing posture, um, all babies, newborns are going to have that similar posture, um, and that can really tell us more about um, like their APGAR scores, not necessarily their physical maturity. And the apical pulse, that's going to be consistent no matter how old they are, what gestational age they were born. Um, flex the elbow up, that is not going to tell us how old they are, but um, depending on how much extra of that fine downy hair that they have, if they have more hair, um, then they're probably a little bit younger um, for gestational age, and then as they get older that hair tends to slough off, uh, they're getting closer to their actual due date. Um, so we want to look for the hair to determine their, their physical maturity. Okay, so the nurse is examining a six-month-old infant. The pers persistence of which reflex should the nurse recognize as abnormal? So if they're still having this at six months, um, it should uh, raise a red flag. So plantar, moro, sucking or Babinski. So if we can kind of go back and remember that slide um, talking about the reflexes and when should they typically should disappear. Um, the plantar reflex is going to disappear at 8 to 10 months. 
Moro or the startle reflex is going to disappear around three months. Um, sucking is going to disappear around 10 months to a year. And the Babinski's is going to disappear around two years old. So um, if we're still having a startle reflex at six months that should have disappeared at three months, um, then we should recognize that as abnormal and notify the provider. Okay, so next question. Um, a mother brings her two-month-old infant into the healthcare clinic because she's noticed a bulge in the umbilical that seems to get bigger when the baby cries. The nurse recognized this as what type of finding? So diastasis rectus or recti, um, normal umbilicus, um, umbilical hernia, or a scaffold abdomen. So any sort of pressure, um, increased pressure when the baby's crying on their abdominal wall um, and you notice any sort of bulging around the umbilical area, if they're two months old, then that umbilical cord has obviously fallen out by now. Um, it's gonna be considered an umbilical hernia. So those are really common in infants. Um, typically they disappear once they're up and walking, right around a year old. Um, that scaffold abdomen is like the boat-like shape, um, almost looks like their rib cage is real prominent and then it kind of sinks down into their abdomen and then their hips kind of come back up. Um, the diastasis rectus, that or recti, that's what um, moms get after being pregnant. Um, the uh, abdominal wall becomes weak and then there's kind of that gap in between the, the abdominal muscles. Um, and of course it's not an, a normal belly button because um, it's uh, got signs of an umbilical hernia. Um, like I said, most of the time the provider will just recommend to watch it um, and then once they're up and walking that abdominal wall becomes a little bit stronger um, it tends to disappear once they're a little older. Okay, so during an examination of a newborn, the nurse touches the upper lip so that the newborn will move the head toward the stimulated area and open the mouth. What reflex is the nurse eliciting from this action? So is it sucking, palmer, plantar, or rooting? So remember rooting, they're going to turn their mouth toward that stimulation and try to latch on, hopefully um, thinking that it's a breast, but um, sometimes it's just a mean nurse tricking them and, and making sure that their reflexes are intact. Um, but that is a, a positive sign for rooting. Okay, so the nurse is assessing a three-month-old infant and finds the foreskin tightened around the glands of the penis and in a retracted position. Which term should the nurse use to document this finding in the medical record? Hypospadus, um, phimosis, paraphimosis, or epispadus. So if you can kind of think back to um, that previous um, slide, Hypospadus is when the urethral open, opening is under the gland. Um, phimosis, that's where the foreskin cannot be retracted over the tip of the penis. Um, paraphimosis, that is the swelling and edema within the foreskin left in a retracted position. And then the epispadus, that's um, on the dorsal side when the urethra opening is on the top of the gland. So your correct answer is C. And that's just straight memorization. You need to know what's what and how it looks. That's typically how the question is going to be asked to you. A nurse is assessing a newborn immediately after delivery and finds a white cheesy substance on the infant's skin, especially within the folds of the skin. How should the nurse document this finding? Lanugo, ecchymosis, erythema, tox, toxum, or vernix cassation. Um, and so you will see this on, um, kind of like I said, it goes along hand in hand with Lanugo. The 
the more premature the baby is, the more that they'll have this, um, but it helps protect their skin while they're um, in utero. So that white cheesy substance, um, that's called vernix. Um, and then the nugo is the extra amount of like fine downy hair that newborns will have. Um, but the younger they are, the more vernix that they'll, they'll typically have on their skin. But it just wipes right off kind of acts as like shea butter and helps protect their skin and so even once they're born if they have a little bit of extra we don't like to wipe it off um, and just throw it away we kind of like massage it into their skin um, and it acts as like a protective barrier and, and moistens and softens their skin um, so it's really good for them okay so a mother of a one-month-old infant um, call the healthcare clinic and tells the nurse that she is concerned because that her uh, when her infant cries, the top of his head seems to push out. What questions should the nurse ask the mother to gather more information about this finding? So we've noticed some basically bulging um, on the fontanelle, um, and especially when the baby's crying. So. What do we want to ask her? How many times a day is the baby feeding? Um, was your baby delivered vaginally or by a cesarean section? Does the bulge stop when the baby stops crying? Um, or how, how many wet diapers is the infant having a day? So um, we can kind of eliminate B um, because um, we know that that doesn't really matter the the mode of delivery um, what we're concerned about is um, increased cranial pressure right if it's bulging while they're crying um, we want to we want to find out a little bit more about that so um, how many times a day is the baby feeding um, does the bulging stop when the baby stops crying or how many wet diapers um, is the infant having a day. So um, A and D are kind of similar and it's asking more about dehydration, right? Um, so if the baby is dehydrated, you're gonna have those sunken fontanelles. Um, so how many times is the baby feeding a day? If the mom was calling concerned that the baby's head has this dip, dip in the head right over the fontanelles, uh, that might be an appropriate answer choice. Same thing with lists. Maybe the baby's not very well hydrated. We're not having many wet or poopy diapers. And so we also are going to see um, once the dehydration gets severe enough that um, like a concaved um, you know, spot on the baby's head, on that soft spot. Um, but does the bulging stop when the baby stops crying. So maybe it's just got that increased cranial pressure because the baby's crying, but once the baby stops, then it's flat, looks normal, everything's okay. That's just a normal sign. So that's going to give me, that question's going to give me the answer um, that I really need. So if it's still bulging once the baby stops crying, then we got bigger problems, right? Because then maybe the baby's crying because it has increased cranial pressure um, and it's not just having increased cranial pressure while they're crying. Hopefully that makes sense. A nurse is assessing a newborn of African-American descent and observes a bluish pigment, uh, pigmented area on the sacrum. The nurse recognizes this as what type of skin variation? Trauma from delivery Talangeic natic nevi, or um, those are the stork bites. Erythema toxium, or Mongolian spots. And so remember I said it's more common on darker skinned babies, uh, babies that have um, deeper pigments to have those Mongolian spots. So this is actually that bluish pigmented area, typically over the sacrum, sometimes over the upper back as well. Those are considered Mongolian spots. A nurse elicits the plantar grasp reflex in a newborn and notes it's, it is it to be diminished. What should the nurse do to, in regards to this finding? So what are we going to do if we notice that the plantar grasp of a baby um, isn't very strong? So we're going to assess the newborn for other signs of prematurity, 
check the response on the other side, then notify the healthcare provider immediately, or document this as an abnormal finding. So, um, check the response on the other side. Um, typically, when we're doing the plantar grasp, you're doing it bilaterally. You want to assess um, things at the same time. So, um, that's not really the most appropriate answer choice here. Notify the healthcare provider immediately. Um, not something that you need to go and rush for the phone, um, but you um, are not going to document this as an abnormal finding because we want to see what else is going on with this baby. Um, the answer is further assess for other signs of prematurity. Um, so it could be that this baby is just really young. It doesn't have um, that strong reflex yet. And so maybe there's something else going on. Do they have increased lanugo? Um, you know, are there other signs of prematurity that's happening with this baby that um, I need to find all the assessment data first and then I can call my health care healthcare provider. Okay, a nurse inspects the anus of a newborn. Which of the following findings should be referred immediately to a specialist? Passing of meconium, imperforate anus, um, perianal skin tag, or a pustule? So um, if the baby has passed meconium, then we know that the anus is patent and then that's good. Um, skin tags don't need an, an immediate referral to a specialist and neither do pustules. Those typically resolve themselves. Um, but an anus that is um, not opened, then that is something that the baby is going to need emer emergency surgery for um, and that I do need to call a specialist immediately. All right, so hopefully that was helpful for you. Um, if you need anything else um, or would like to further discuss this chapter or, or any other chapters in the book and kind of do a deeper dive into the content, um, please come by and see us in the Student Success Center. We also will review your previous test questions with you and go over your tests and kind of go over the rationales of why maybe you picked that answer and um, talk about test taking strategies and study skills and life habits in nursing school. So um, please come by and see us and make an appointment with us. Um, if you want, you can email or call me um, or you can book an appointment on the Student Success website. It's probably the best way to do it. Um, and then we just encourage you, if you are going to make an appointment to review your previous test, um, please make that appointment before your next test. Um, so that way all those questions are fresh on your mind um, and we can kind of do a review as we go through the semester. Um, again, I hope that helped you um, and I wish you the best of luck.